you um, check out our podcast. They have a whole host of podcasts on these issues of poverty and economics and things like that. Uh, in the middle of here is Dr. Clark. He is a philosophy professor who is also involved in the uh, Melbourne Institute for America, but obviously from a philosophical perspective, not just the economics of what goes on, but how it ought to be. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to lose back to Dr. Peter uh, Jacobson, Dr. Jacobson. Just attended his dissertation in the fall. Uh, he just joined us this year. Um, and so I'm excited that he's uh, over with me today as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Clark, I think, who's kicking us off. And it's live. They just switched it, so. Isn't it? Let's give the testing. I don't know. <laughs> testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. Okay. All right. Uh, can everybody? Read what's on the board. I don't know if all of you yes. in the back. Yes. Okay. Can everyone hear me in the back? Fantastic. All right. So uh, today, I know Peter and Russ are going to talk a little bit about thinking in terms of investments, and that's been really useful lately. Um, well, before we get into thinking about things that bring money, uh, I'm going to talk about thinking about thinking, and in particular, um, the ways in which I think very poorly, because that can come back to bite us. Um, so before we get into thinking about thinking, uh, why would you think critical thinking is important? Um, well, there's a couple ways in which you can get things done. The two classic ways to get things done are to do it yourself, or to get somebody else to do it for you. Um, the problem with doing things yourself is that it's hard to do everything yourself. Uh, you know, uh, so how do you get other people to do what you want them to do? How do you get other people to do what you want them to do? Pay them? Who said pay them? Extra credit. Fantastic. Uh, other ways to get people to do what you want them to do? Just ask. If I have a plumbing problem, should I just ask what's the best solution to that one? Probably pay someone, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, if, uh, you know, if I want my, if I'm really stressed out and I want my wife to help put my son to bed tonight, how should I go about doing that? Persuade. Persuade? Yeah. Should I, should I pay her? It's five dollars in the alley. Uh, yeah, so we have these different strategies that we want to use um, depending on what we want to get done and uh, who we're dealing with. Uh, but the point is, we can't get everything done ourselves. We have to get other people to help us out. So, uh, there's generally two ways to get people to do what you want them to do. And the first is to convince them. Um, oh, sorry, the first is to force them to get them out of order. Um, the second is to convince them. It's in your best interest to be able to convince people. And paying people and asking them to do your favor, those both go in the convincing category. It's in your best interest to get people, uh, to be able to convince people, since forcing others to do what you want can be difficult, time consuming, and it may involve inconvenient person sentences. Now, probably the best way to convince someone to do what you want them to do is to show them that doing what you want them to do is in their best interest. Therefore, they tell them what you want them to do is actually what they should want to do. And when you do this, fantastic. Everybody wins. Uh, have you ever done this? Yes? When? Little brother. Little brother. How'd that work? Yeah, little brothers are right for this kind of, uh, and maybe even that goes on in the next slide, too. Um, but if I have a plumbing problem and I call the plumber and I offer to pay them, presumably the plumber wants my money uh, more than they want their time that afternoon, and I certainly want my plumbing problem fixed more than I want the money that I'm going to give up, right? Um, so that's what's going on when we do that kind of thing. Great. However, uh, a very common way to convince someone to do what you want them to do is to fool them into doing 
doing what you want them to do by convincing them that it's in their best interest. And this, uh, you may be a much better older brother than I am, but I did this a lot when I was a older brother. And I would try to fool my younger brother into thinking uh, that what, you know, what I wanted to do is what he really wanted to do. Um, this is actually a really useful skill to master because oftentimes what you want other people to do isn't in their best interest, but you still want them to do it. Have you ever done this? Trick somebody into doing what you want them to do? Any other people in here who are sometimes immoral, or is it just me? <laughs> okay. Uh, however, there's a problem. And the problem is that you all are people. You don't want to be forced to do things. You'd probably rather be convinced. Uh, well, what could go wrong with being convinced? Unfortunately, a lot. That is, we can often be convinced into doing things that aren't in our best interest. So let's take a quick detour and look at Heaven's Gate. You all are probably too young to know what Heaven's Gate is. Does anybody know what Heaven's Gate is? Yes, one person. Okay. Well, great. Let's take a quick look. This is a logo on the bottom. As you can see, it's pretty sharp. Uh, Heaven's with a gate. They both share the A. And there's a keyhole, which gates often have. Uh, the members of Heaven's Gate follow a man named Marshall Applewhite, who called himself Doe, who's on the right there. Uh, and Bonnie Nettles, who called herself T, and they met in a psychiatric hospital where he was a patient and she was a nurse. And they believed that the Earth was uh, going to be recycled, and that their only chance for surviving was to be transported to an alien spaceship which was hiding behind the Hale-Bopp comet, which was passing by the Earth in 1997. This was announced in high school, that's why I remember it. Um, that's Marshall Applewhite on the right in one of his videos that he made in 1996. Uh, so, does everything look on the up and up so far? Sound like a good plan? Okay. Well, uh, they attempted to join this, this spaceship by ingesting applesauce that they made with fuel orbital, uh, which they washed down with vodka before putting on matching jumpsuits and placing plastic bags over their heads. And they all were matching 90s too, so they looked pretty sharp. Uh, oh, I also forgot. Uh, the gentlemen in the group castrated themselves before they did this. Uh, so, what do you think happened to these people? They were named criminal insane. <laughs> that would have been uh, an even better outcome than it happened. Because what happened is, once they ingested all this fuel harbor all put the plastic bags over their heads, they all died. Um, and they were found dead in their compound, having all ingested uh, the poison and the plastic bags over their heads. So they were found dead in matching jumpsuits in the 90s um, and castrated. Um, now, did all these people think that what they were doing was in their best interest? Yeah, they did. That's why they did it. Right? The Earth was going to be recycled. Let's go get on that comet with the aliens. They're going to save us. Uh, so. Uh, how do we avoid this kind of reasoning? Why bring up Heaven's Gate? Well, because we're bad at thinking critically. Uh, we can be talked into doing a lot of stuff. What are the key, what are some key reasoning mistakes people make? In short, how do we make sure we don't end up in those jumpsuits? And I looked up people in jumpsuits. This is what I found. So, one way we can avoid ending up in the jumpsuits is by being careful when we attempt to reason causally, that is, reasoning uh, from thinking that one thing causes another. Causal reasoning is one of the most common and important kinds of reasoning we do. If we know that A causes B and we want to avoid B, that gives us a good reason to avoid A. Uh, and likewise, if we know that A causes B and we uh, want to obtain B, that gives us a very good reason uh, to try to make A the case. The only thing left to do is to figure out whether A actually does cause B, and that's very difficult. In fact, we are very, very bad at figuring this kind of thing out intuitively. Um, oftentimes, when we are trying to, when someone's trying to convince us that one thing causes another, they show us some charts and they say, look, these things rise and fall together. We are shown these charts that purport to show that one type of event reliably results in another type of event. And usually, these charts claim to show that there is a causal relationship between these two events. A causal relationship is a 
a necessary relationship. If one event causes another event, then if you have that first event, the second event is guaranteed. Depending on the desirability of the event, which is the effect, these charts are used to get us to either perform or abstain from performing the cause. So let's look at one of these. Now, we are used to seeing charts like this. So this is a chart of uh, CO2 and temperature. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of charts like this uh, given uh, you know, the era in which you've grown up. What is this chart attempting to show us?
actually, if you look at the data, that can't be what's happening. Because it looks like the suicides from before the Japanese mass aircraft are being sold. So maybe people read about the suicides in the paper or see it on television and go, that's a tragedy. Um, nothing would take the edge off this tragedy like buying a Japanese motor car. Does that make sense? Well, that doesn't make sense. We have a problem here uh, because most people think that when we try to establish causation, uh, we try to look at these graphs and figure out if the data rise and fall together. Um, now, these data do rise and fall together, but it's ludicrous that we would take uh, any of these graphs as evidence of causation. It seems like we know, even before we look at the graphs, that uh, Nicholas Cage isn't affecting pool suicides, uh, the spelling bee isn't affecting spider bites, and uh, Japanese passenger car sales aren't uh, determining the amount of suicides every year, suicides by motor vehicle. And if that's the case, um, then it seems like we only trust these charts when we know beforehand that there is a causal relationship between these two uh, elements. And that's a problem for trying to prove causality. So uh, there are a couple, there are six very common ways of making a mistake when you reason causally. Uh, one might be reversing cause and effect. Um, a second could be overlooking a third element, which is the actual cause of both of the purported, uh, both the purported cause and the purported effect. We could also overlook the possibility of coincidence. We could fail to consider a control group. Uh, we could fail to obtain a big enough sample size, and we can engage in post hoc ergo prompter hoc reasoning. I'm not a fan of Latin, but my colleague uh, Peter is really a fan of Latin. Um, <laughs> and um, post hoc ergo prompter hoc means after this, therefore because of this. Um, so I, I don't know if you ever engaged in reasoning like this before, or I engage in this kind of reasoning. Uh, all the time, where I think that, uh, you know, um, I gave my son uh, waffles for breakfast today, and then he wouldn't buckle the seatbelt in the car. I go, that's it. It's the last time he's ever given waffles. <laughs> Just because something happened after something else doesn't mean that that thing that was the cause of something else. What about this graph on the right, where we have ice cream sales and shark attacks? And it seems like the ice cream sales and the shark attacks are, you know, those rise and fall together. Is it that, uh, you know, the sharks are sitting offshore looking, and they say, oh, that one's got ice cream. Humans are tastier when they are, uh, you know, have an ice cream filling. So the way you talk, their bellies are stuffed full of ice cream and then they attack. What would explain this correlation? The weather, right? Uh, when do you eat ice cream? In the summer. Yeah, unless you're an animal like me and you eat it every single night. Uh, when, do you, when do people get attacked by sharks? In the summer. Uh, so there is a common cause for both of these things, and uh, it is not that these things are causally related. Okay, so how do we actually establish causal relations? Well, one of the best ways we know how to do this is with double-line placebo tests. Um, so let's say we're trying to figure out whether a drug, and we can call this drug contendrix, um, actually, say, prevents stomach aches. We could just give one person contendrix and ask if there's stomach aches inside it. But that would be the best way to establish a causal claim. Why not? Stomach ache might have just gone away. It's just... It's just one person, right? Well, we can prove this by giving contenders to a large number of people, but that still won't tell us if contenders works. Why not? What if I give a bunch of people who have a stomach ache contenders today, and then I come back and say, all right, can your stomach ache go away? Just one way, right? 
people on Monday, if I give them contenders on Monday, and on Tuesday I ask them, all right, you're showing dates, they go away, and a statistically significant number of them say yes. Do I get to go, okay, contenders worked? No. Uh, some, how long do some of these usually last? A couple hours? I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, people's stomach aches naturally just uh, cease to exist after a day. We could prove this causal test by comparing the results that people who take contenders get with the results that people who don't take contenders get. So in this case, I give a bunch of people contenders, and then I ask. Uh, I give a bunch of people with stomach aches and contenders, um, and I also don't give a bunch of people with stomach aches and contenders. And then I ask the people who got contenders, do you feel better after a day? And I compare how well they are doing compared to the people who didn't take contenders. Would that be better? Yes. Is there a problem with this? Yes. What's the problem with this one?
Is that enough to establish causation? No, it isn't. If we want to answer complex public policy questions, we need a lot more data than we are usually presented with. And um, people who present arguments based on a very limited amount of data and expect you to believe it uh, ought to uh, be called on it. Finally, here's a, here's a very uh, good comment. It's from XKBC. It says, one person said, uh, says, I used to think correlation implied causation, and then I took a statistics class, and now I don't. The stock rose, went up to 1,200. How many of you know some people who did that? Okay, what they did was called gambling. <laughs> and so we're here today to kind of build on what Dr. Clark did and have you thinking about why it's gambling. Because we have some really good information and evidence to suggest that that is gambling. And so uh, economists call this the efficient market hypothesis. So the idea is that uh, with this spread of information through social media and other sources, uh, it's only increased over time. By the way, this theory, oh, I don't know, was it 40 years ago plus? I mean, this came out like 40 years ago when people were using newspapers for crying out loud and phones that had cords on them. So the spread of information has the stock price adjusting according to that information all the time. And so the stock price at any given moment reflects all available information in the market, which means that the change that it's gonna do in a minute, in a day, maybe in two days for sure, is just a flip of a coin. Nobody has an ounce of information to know that it's gonna go up. So there's a famous book called A Random Walk on Wall Street, and that random walk is the idea that you are just gambling, you're flipping a coin, you're putting all your money on black or all your money on red, which is fine, by the way. I'm not gonna come down on you for gambling. I like gambling, I played Texas Hold'em and blackjack over the years and other things, but just know what you're doing. You're not investing, you're gambling, okay? So that's what we're gonna kind of try to build on today. That's where we're going with the whole thing. We're gonna talk about what people do to actually analyze stocks and what that takes and whether that's even worth anything. So Peter's gonna get us started with uh, information available. So as Russ just kind of alluded to, um, the, the interesting thing about markets is that people can make a lot of money off of them, right? Uh, and there are, in the world, a lot of people that we could, would call insiders. And so insiders, we think of as people who have information before everybody else. Even if there's not insiders, there are actually people who get paid a lot of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, to scan newspapers, social media, all these different things and they look for things that will influence people's opinions about the value of stock. And so, for example, if uh, Elon Musk announces on Twitter that in five months, Tesla's gonna release a new car, well, one way to think about that is, I have to buy Tesla within the next five months, so that way I can get a return. But, that doesn't exactly work. As Russ just pointed out, things adjust immediately. 
So as soon as people know from the first post that Elon Musk makes on Twitter, as soon as people know that there's going to be a new product and they that's going to be valuable, they're going to start buying Tesla stock today. They're not going to wait five months. And so when news hits, people start adjusting immediately. It actually doesn't matter when the product is put out or anything like that. And so I have friends who sometimes do this. I've got friends in my group message who are Robinhood investors who, you know, a few months ago, uh, Elon, specifically Elon Musk and Tesla had a, a big showing. Um, that was going to put out all the new technology that happened, and they were all buying Tesla stock right before. And I said, "You guys don't want to do that. You you don't know that the value is going to go up." And sure enough, the day of the show, nothing goes wrong, but the value actually goes down. Why would the value go down after this show? Yeah, no one wanted to buy someone said. Um, the, the idea is that the announcement actually was a little bit, uh, you know, grandiose in the actual event that happened today. Of, and so, based on the announcement, people bought, bought the stock. But the actual event wasn't quite as good as people were expecting. And so, this is the point: if that always happens, if all the news is taken into a, a account, then stock prices, if there's no information to go off of, the only thing they could be is random. And so, stock prices actually carry a lot of information. Uh, they carry information about news is, about news that happens. If stock prices go up, well, there must be some good news. If stock prices go down, there must be some good news. And so an example of stock prices carrying information, uh, this is a classic example. Uh, this is an economist, Armin Alshin, uh, was an economist from the 50s up until the 2000s, uh, really heavy in the profession. Uh, if you want a story afterwards, he's probably the only person to ever lose a Nobel Prize because he played too much golf. Uh, but I'll save that for a story for afterwards. Um, so Armin Alshin, in the 50s, was working for a group called the Rand Corporation. And this is a corporation in Washington, D.C. that basically tries to do national security things using uh, economic, financial, and other data. And what Alshin did is he thought, he was sitting in his office and he thought, you know, I'm going to try to figure out what they're making the hydrogen bomb out of. Uh, the hydrogen bomb was in development, so we already had nuclear weapons, but I guess the government decided we need a bigger nuclear weapon that uses hydrogen instead. The explosions aren't bigger, pretty enough, or something like that. And so they develop this, and Armin Alshin says, I bet I can figure out what's in this thing. And so Alshin looks at stock prices, and he looks at a few of the different elements. This is all publicly available information. And he finds that, that's weird, these three companies that deal in the element lithium all skyrocketed in value despite their earnings reports not being that high this year. And so Alshin deduces from this, what he finds is that, well, it must be that this element, which could be used as a nuclear fission fuel, is being used as, used as nuclear fission fuel. Uh, lithium. And if you want evidence that Alshin was correct, first off, you know, you can look historically that that's what happens. Uh, but more evidence is that the government actually came into Alshin's office tonight, took all the papers, deemed them a national security threat, and he was told not to look into this anymore. Uh, and so economic security is information that's not even publicly available. No one in the stock market knew that these firms were developing the nuclear bomb. It was top secret. It was government information. And yet, the stock price still carried that information in because certain things that the company was doing informed investors indirectly uh, that that company was going to make a lot of money soon. And so stock prices uh, are, are taking into account even secret information. And so if you, if, we'll get into this in a second, but if you think you can beat that, if you think you can beat that information, uh, you might have another thing coming. Um, another example of this, so the, the recent uh, discussion with Robinhood has been about short selling. And a lot of people have focused on the negatives of selling short. And I actually, I love what happened with Robinhood and Gate Shop. I think it's a lot of fun. But I do want to point out that short selling is another way that information is transmitted. Short selling essentially is betting that in the future the company's value is going to go down. And so when you sell short, you're saying, I think that this company is going to do worse next year. And so one thing that short selling can do is it can identify, we've got up there just in, in, in an image that says corporate fraud, it can identify corporate fraud. In fact, Short sells are actually the most accurate identifier of corporate fraud. People recognize some things going on in the company that they don't think make sense, and 30% of the time when people sell short to identify corporate fraud, uh, they succeed. And you might think, well, 30%, that's not very good, that's not very great accuracy. But when you compare it to the government agency, the Securities and Exchange Commission, that gets paid billions of dollars to identify fraud, identify fraud in the market, uh, they blow this out of the water. And so, uh, again, the market carries information, communicates things about the world uh, without even saying it. it it's, it's a very interesting uh, device for communicating information. Okay, so yeah, I'll take the clicker here. She wants that fancy laser again, the red one. All right, so um, to get into different ways information flows, uh,
off to the right, I've got a chart, and that's actually GameStop. How many of you have seen some of those charts of stocks? That's called the candlestick one, where there's, it looks like little candlesticks. Those of you may be taking some business classes. And, and so that is something called technical analysis. And so basically a bunch of uh, geeks that are finance geeks on Wall Street and other people that are day traders that uh, you know don't see the light of day basically all day because they're in their pajamas. Uh, eating ramen soup and trying to uh, make money on, on the, during the day on watching trends is when when a stock's going up, I buy and then I make a little money and I sell, right? So that's kind of the idea of, of day trading. And what you're doing is you're using all past historical knowledge to base your decision. So that's technical trading. And everybody's got that kind of down. And so one of the things that the efficient market hypothesis says over on the weak form is that technical analysis does not work uh, because there's a lot more other information that's getting spread about expectations and what's going to happen with the stock and what's happening with the economy and the global economy and terrorism and you name it all of that's going to get folded into the value of the of the stock as well so technical trading you can spend hours and hours and take courses and courses and and get upper level degrees like uh, Professor uh, George is doing, uh, getting his doctorate, and learn every little tiny rock to turn over and every insight known on what makes these charts tick. And you, what the efficient market hypothesis says, you're not gonna be any further ahead. It's not worth it. Nobody can systematically beat the market. All right, well, one guy that did beat the market for a while, uh, this, we can't see it up in the right, upper right hand corner is a picture of Warren Buffett. How many of you have heard of Warren Buffett? So he's probably the most, one of the most famous investors. He really made famous what he called value investing. And value investing is really fundamental analysis. So his idea was, you know, a lot of people out there are looking at short-term gains and stuff. I'm going to analyze the actual value of this company and kind of treat the company as a thing that makes money and profit. And so off to the left there, I've got eight steps. And by the way, we're going to have links to all these videos. Um, how many of you have checked out some videos online with uh, the rise of GameStop and like whether I should invest, maybe some investing videos? Once I started looking, um, I was actually somewhat disgusted. So this is part of the, we thought the reason this um, talk was important is all the make money now, invest in eToro, and you can be a part of savvy Wall Street traders and get their information so that you can make money. There's all kinds of stuff that you guys are gonna be pounded with that doesn't make sense according to efficient market hypothesis. There's not that kind of information out there. And there's actually good news at the end of our talk of what you can do uh, to still make a lot of money and become millionaires if you guys desire to in all likelihood. So I got that as the last little morsel that we get to. But those eight steps right there can take four hours to analyze one single company. And then you're gonna have to analyze companies the same way you just did in the industry, the competitors of that company. And then you're gonna analyze the other suppliers to that industry. You're gonna have to really do a lot of analysis to get to the level that you need to make a decent bet, a long-term bet, by the way. I'm, so this is not gambling. This is more on the investing side of, of finding the company that you think is gonna be a good long-run player, right? A good company that's gonna be around for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years that I'm gonna put my money into and my money's gonna grow over time so that I can have a nice million dollar nest egg uh, at the end of the day. Well, you need to be doing that. And so, but here's the thing, even Warren Buffett, the most well-known investor around, has not been able to systematically beat the overall market. What do I mean by that? If we take like all of the top 500 stocks, so one measure is the S&P 500, that's used as a benchmark. So the best 500, or the biggest 500 companies, and we put our money in all 500 companies at once, and we track that, over time, let's say they're making 12%. So if you're a savvy investor like Warren Buffett, in order to prove how good you are, how much money do you need to be making in terms of a rate of return if the S&P 500, the top 500 companies on average are making 12%, what does the savvy Warren Buffett investor need to do? How much do they need to make to be saying they're beating the market? How much, more than 12, equal to 12, less than 12? More than 12, right? To beat the market, Warren Buffett would need to be systematically getting 13%, 14%, 16%. He did have actually a long stretch of time where he was doing that, and that's why he was kind of crowned the king of, of investing. 
But lo and behold, competition has it. Warren Buffett had a secret sauce, and it wasn't exactly super private, so a lot of other people started doing his techniques, and then the profit differential disappeared back to the market. And so Warren Buffett over the years has not been able to systematically beat the market uh, either. And so that's one of our lessons here, is that the real world lives somewhere, let's see if this laser, there it is, right there. So the strong form says no investor can win. I think over time, some investors can win some of the time. So the real world is somewhere over there. How many of you want to spend four hours of your time invest, or looking at one single company to put one single stock in? How many of you, I want to see a show of hands on this one. How many of you can think of better ways to spend four hours of your time? Show of hands. You're right. Live your life. You can do this real easy by finding some alternative investments. You can actually invest in the market. So, what is the way to invest in the market? How many of you heard of mutual funds? Mutual funds. That's the best way to do it. So, what you want to do is invest in all 500 of those companies at one time. And what you can do is buy a single share of a mutual fund. So, a company that does this, for instance, not to put in any extra plug, is Vanguard. So, Vanguard has a financial product that's called basically the S&P 500 Index Fund, Mutual Fund. And all they're doing is this big multi-billion dollar company is simply mirroring the top 500. So if the top 500 changes and one company goes out of the 500 and a new one comes into the 500, they alter the portfolio. And then they sell you that freaking portfolio for a hundred bucks. You can invest in the top, biggest, brightest companies by just putting in a hundred bucks. You've instantly bought 500 companies with as little as 100 bucks, if that's what the share price is of the mutual fund. And so that is the way that you can get this instant diversification, which usually would have to take millionaires to buy all 500 stocks individually. You can do it instantly, and you can have it automatically deducted from your paycheck. Um, if you get into a company that has a 401k retirement plan, which most companies have some form of that, and you're gonna to want to do what we call dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost averaging. When the market's up, when the market's high, stock prices are high, there's been a lot of stock market games. Is that the best time to put your money in? No. When the stock market's low and prices are low, is that the best time to put your money in? Yes. So here's what dollar cost averaging is. Nobody knows the timing of that up and that down. Not even Warren Buffett, right? Nobody can predict that timing. And so here's what dollar cost averaging is. When the stock market's up this month, put your $100 in. When the stock market's down next month, put your $100 in. When the stock market goes up a little bit, put your $100 in. When the stock market goes way down, put your $100 in. When the stock market goes way up, put your $100 in. $100, $100, $100, $100, $100. Am I boring anybody yet? It's boring. It's not as sexy as buying when it's getting on Robin Hood and jumping on AMC or GameStop and getting that electric juice flowing. It's pretty dang boring, right? You're not going to be able to brag to your friends quite as much, but I guess I can guarantee you this, it's your best pathway to being rich. Because nobody, not even Warren Buffett, can beat the market, and you have the opportunity to play the entire market through investing in these things. And here's the best part. How many hours did I spend thinking about my investments when I'm using dollar cost averaging? Fraction of an hour maybe? Five minutes? You guys just got the secret sauce right there. Market's up, 100 bucks. Market's down, 100 bucks. You don't think about it. You're just automatically putting in. You wanna check on it maybe every year or two years or five years or whatever. You might need to make a few adjustments here and there. For the most part, live your life. Play your games, go do your sports, have kids, you know? Live your life and be an investor. You don't have to be that investor. Uh, go ahead, Peter. I just wanted to dispel now at the end maybe a few different myths or, or uh, objections here. And I just want to make clear some of the things that we're saying. So one thing you can say is, well, well, you told me that like putting money in was was gambling. So you know it either goes up or it either goes down. Why should I put any money in at all? Uh, but to clarify, and, and I think Russ did make this point, is that 
overall, if you put your money in like everything at once, the market does go up, and that's something that you can bet on. Uh, over time, it has. Now, it's not a sure thing forever necessarily, uh, but over the last 100, 150 years, the trends have been up for the market as a whole. The difference is when you're picking individual stocks, individual stocks don't always go up over 100 years. Sometimes they shoot way up, like Amazon has done. Sometimes they disappear, like Sears, for example, was the biggest company in America in the 1950s, gone. Um, and it didn't happen slowly, it happened pretty quickly for Sears in like the 90s, and the, the 80s and the 90s. Uh, so individual stocks is like gambling, because you don't have any more information than anybody else. The market has captured the information of millions of people investing, and the likelihood you're gonna be this low. Now, another objection might be like, I did just win. Maybe some of you did the GameStop thing, and you, you're thinking to yourself, well, that's all well and good, but apparently I can beat the market. But another thing to keep in mind is don't mistake like temporary success for actually this long-term beating the market thing. These are different things. Just like Russ said, you know, this is betting on red or betting on black. If you go to a casino right now, you could put $800 on red and black, and you've got a good chance of winning, actually. It's 50%, assuming they don't like rig the wheels or anything, which I'm not convinced of, but you know, if, if they don't, you've got a 50% shot. And so you can win by gambling. But the problem is when you mistake that, kind of like Justin was talking about, when you mistake the fact that you won in the past for winning in the future, you know, that's like saying that, oh, in the past I've got some trends where there's a correlation, therefore I must be a winner, I must be beating the market. And that's not true either. Uh, and then finally, you know, the third thing is, you and Russ mentioned, you're gonna get a lot of advertisements in your life where you should go with us, and for example, maybe you'll have a management firm that says, hey, we get 14% return every year, that beats the market. Uh, but another thing to keep in mind is that uh, these services aren't free. And so sometimes there are individual managing firms that quote unquote beat the market, but the reason that they can beat the market is because they're charging uh, a return that's actually greater than what you could have gotten on the market itself. And so there's firms out there that'll get a 14% return, uh, but they'll charge you 2%. And so you're actually getting 12%, which is worse than the market again. And that's actually what you find if you look at the world, you find that just individual investing in index funds historically has beat managed funds once you deduct the management fee almost all the time. And so, uh, you know, th this isn't a discouragement that you shouldn't consider, you know, looking at investing at all, uh, but just know what you're doing and, and recognize that uh, just because you've had past success or someone tells you they've had success doesn't mean that uh, that means that in the future there's going to be success. Yes, there's always uh, big fish out there. The day traders will tell you about their wins, but they like to not talk about their losses. And I'm a fisherman, so you talk about the big fish, but you don't talk about all the little ones that were out there or the days that you didn't get anything, perhaps. Um, so that's kind of common in the investing world. People are talking about their wins, but not so much about their losses. So you got to be aware of those people on TV telling you that stuff. So my last bullet point down there is, um, if you want to invest in single stocks, um, you know, treat it as a game, treat it as a very high risk thing. So the recommendation that I've heard financial gurus such as Dave Ramsey, how many of you have had my personal finance class or are in it or had it? So you'll learn a lot of this stuff. Those of you who are freshmen, if you take my personal finance class, um, Again, personal finance is 80% behavior and 20% finance, but we kind of teach this type of stuff to invest in. And one of his words of wisdom, and there's other people that say the same, is never put more than 10% of your long-term investing into some you know, high-risk thing or you know, whether you're investing in GameStop. I think that's pretty good words of advice. So let's say you guys have built up, uh, you're, you're in your first job and you've got $10,000 saved up for, this is your retirement fund. It says you can take $1,000 and play with it. You want to bet on gold or bet on the new latest, greatest stock, GameStop, AMC, follow Reddit, whatever. But make sure you leave that 9,000 in those mutual funds playing the market. You see how we're kind of hedging our bet? You can still have your fun, but never expose yourself to more than 10% of that. And then what you'll probably find is that after you lose that 1,000, you're like, oh, I'm just gonna keep 100% in the mutual funds. Turns out McCullough was probably right at that, at that thing that he learned about with that economic theory. And maybe it's just as fun to start getting those uh, returns in uh, playing the market is what I found. Because I've been burned. I've been burned when I thought I had inside information. I knew those, some owners of a company that was going public and we played poker with them and thought they were coming. And so I put, I don't know, a couple thousand bucks on it. Lost everything. I thought I had inside information. I knew the owners of the company when they were going public. So I lost when I was in high school. I put $500 into a penny stock company. So I hope that some of you have some early losses because this is a lot easier to understand when you've made that bet and lost because $500 was a lot of money for me as a junior in high school. And so there's a lot easier ways uh, to have those wins. 
Okay, so you're gonna get a copy of these PowerPoints. So we have the videos that we kind of created our PowerPoints from, and there's also books on the right-hand side to check out on investing if you're really into it. I'm not trying to discourage you who are really into it to be a finance major and learn more. It's fun, and here's the thing. If you are a finance major, you really get into it, then you should just go work for a company and help clients get their money into the right thing because you can make a lot of money. Just regular income paycheck, not money on beating the market, but now you're gonna be on what Peter was talking about with those management fees. You're gonna get fees, kind of commissions or otherwise. And so you can make a nice living out of working in the finance industry. So the Gordon Institute and our professors here have a lot of fun things um, lined up for you guys. Uh, Social Dilemma is our movie night next week on Tuesday. So that's an open event. We'll have uh, popcorn and candy and snacks. And um, so the Social Dilemma, it's been on Netflix. Um, and we have some special inside clips that we got from the company uh, to add on to that. Um, if you've already watched it, um, it's a good movie to watch again. Uh, Dr. Clark's going to be doing a lot of stuff on free speech. We've done some podcasts on that, and so we have some uh, things coming up on uh, things like Urbit. How many of you have heard of Urbit? It's kind of an outsider thing. I probably should let Dr. Clark talk about it, but... It's basically, if you think you're being tracked by Facebook and you don't like giving all your data to everybody, you can own all your data. There are systems be evolving to where you can privately own all your stuff and still communicate. Each time you send a text message, are you, is you and the person who receives it the only people for sure who see that text message? Or is it housed somewhere in some database that the evil people might get to, right? That's what the movies are built on. Well. There's, there's systems that are evolving to allow more privacy, and, and so that's kind of some of the fun things we'll be exploring uh, this term with the Gordon Institute. Finally, the PEE major uh, is the, the new major here, so we've got philosophy, politics, and economics, kind of a blending of all that stuff, and uh, so talk to Dr. Clark if you're interested in that. And that is it. So I wanted to leave a little time for questions. Who wants to throw the toughest questions out? Questions. I don't know if we have an extra microphone floating around. Who's got a question? One question. the top, live off of 120, 
how much do you still have in investments? A million, right? That's retirement planning. Now, you guys are lucky. You're hearing this stuff right now. You can make this happen when you're 50. You might be a little bit alive, but you guys can start living that way when you're 50. Don't wait till 65. Retire young, retire early, retire proud. Adios. I'm sure. Oh! And wait, we got t-shirts. We have some. Oh. We have some t-shirts and other things. Wait! It's okay. The fun part! Oh. <laughs> 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 He's not chucking up. Oh, Peter! Peter! Peter. Peter. You want a pen?